Uh, we are back again for part two of preserving the Haitian culture. I'm excited, honored, and delighted to have my guests with us tonight, and we'll introduce them very soon. I am Dr. Fayola Delica. I am your Miss Haiti Excellence 2020. And if you have not been living on the earth, or especially in Florida, you uh, may not know that May is uh, Haitian Heritage Month. And so we have a few guests that represent the Haitian culture in various uh, capacities. And so I'm honored and delighted uh, to celebrate my beautiful culture, my beautiful people, the beautiful tradition of where my parents are from. I am first generation Haitian American, proud of it. And um, we are here to educate you all. Uh, for those that may not know their history or those that may not uh, know about the Haitian culture, people or history. And so uh, before we get started, we're gonna play a little music so we can make sure that our, our guests coming on because we got a few more coming on. So just bear with us, but definitely uh, you can jam. We're gonna play a little good music, good little Haitian music. So we're gonna do a quick education. So we're gonna do? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't with Captain Haiti. No, we're not gonna do TikTok <laughs> or no quick clock. But uh, definitely we're gonna listen to uh, Alan Cave. I don't own rights to his song. And the song is called Fuck, F-O-K. The first time I heard this song, I was like, I cannot play this song. <laughs> Sounds like another bad word. But this of course, when you read the rest of the lyrics, that's not what it's saying. So, well, I guess it could be, but we're not doing any subliminal messages today. We just gonna enjoy some good music. So this is Alan Cave Fuck. So just have a good time while we wait for the, some of our guests to come on, cause we wanna make sure we get this party started. Right? Yeah. Uh-oh, what did I do? Volume, volume, volume. That's the highest I got. Captain Haiti's trying to jam. Yeah. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Y'all need to vibe with me. Don't let me go by myself now. <laughs> I'm definitely vibing. Love cousin, are we? I get jealous. Wait. Wait. Oh God. Okay, when you have been shown, Vidi, 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 Vidi. 
<laughs> you know, Captain Eddie, you better behave yourself. <laughs> oh my goodness, y'all, y'all see what kind of guests I have tonight. We hope that we will behave ourselves. Uh, Cause my guests, you can see, they will not behave themselves. So I gotta keep them under control. Yes, 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 my team. <laughs> we are excited to have them with us uh, tonight. We'll be continuing our dialogue that we had two weeks ago. An awesome dialogue, a good dialogue. That yes, the request indeed. was to have part two. So we have some returning guests and some new guests. And unfortunately, one of our new guests could not be with us. We want to give him a shout out. Jean Mapu, who's the owner of Mapu uh, Bookstore in Little Haiti, Miami, Florida. He is a pillar in the community. He's a curator of the Haitian culture. We wanted to have him on here as uh, someone who has a plethora. When you go to his bookstore, books on various aspects, different topics about the Haitian culture and French and English and uh, Spanish probably, talking about our beautiful culture. And definitely that is a place you need to go. If you ever visit Miami or you are in Miami and you've never been to Mabu's Mapu's bookstore, or maybe it's been a while, you definitely need to go to check out his bookstore when it opens up. Um, He's an awesome man. And so uh, it's sad that we cannot have him on with us today due to the weather back home as I am out of town. I hear that it's been raining cats and dogs, literally. In yeah. South. So we hope that he stays safe and we hope to have him on another opportune time uh, to discuss the, preserving the Haitian culture and uh, just giving us some insight. I think it's very good uh, to continue having dialogue from uh, our pillars in the community. You know, I love um, art artifacts. Uh, I love archiving things because just like my my godfather and my uncle and my godmother, they are major pillars in the Haitian community locally and abroad. And so I try to suck in as much information as I can because I know one day they will not be with us. Uh, they're not going to be here forever. So I try to make sure that I, I get as much good information because what you read in books and what you hear, but it's one thing when you actually get it from firsthand individuals who have actually experienced the Haitian culture and historical moments in Haitian history uh, locally and abroad. But on that note, so I am Dr. Fayola Delika, Your Miss Haiti Excellence 2020. I am First Generation Haitian American. I am by profession a nurse. I've been in the healthcare industry for over 20 years. I have been an educator for about 17. Oh my God. Mm, <laughs> oh my God. I feel, <laughs> that just made me remember how old I am. Captain Haiti, behave yourself. <laughs> you started at two o'clock. Uh, you, you started at two years old. That's right. I started at two years uh, old. Yes, nope. yes. Y'all see it. Y'all see it. Uh -huh. oh, um, <laughs> I graduated from the University of Florida. That was my first degree in health education. And so, um, done a lot of different things after getting my first two degrees. I have traveled the world. I have competed in pageants. I'm a business owner, serial entrepreneur, international award-winning speaker, international best-selling author, times two on both of those, uh, number one uh, Amazon best-selling author. Uh, I am an ordained pastor. I'm an apostle, Captain Haiti. <laughs> I'm just going like not look at him. Hey, I, I, I salute you, queen. I salute you. <laughs> Oh, you gotta love Captain Haiti. And so, um, ordained pastor, an apostle, a community leader, a nonprofit professional. I mean, the list goes on and on. As people say, Google me, baby. Google, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, do we, do we you Google say, Melissa? doctor? Actually, about to do that now. <laughs> Go ahead, girl. You will find some things. You know, anything that don't look right, it ain't me, okay? It ain't me, it ain't me, it ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a few decades, Google is going to be fire on me, baby. Get it? Get yeah, it? drop the mic on that. <laughs> <laughs> See, Captain Eddie going to boot somebody head. They're going to be walking around here with a swollen head. <laughs> So, uh, so that's just a little bit about me, just to introduce. Uh, I'm just honored and excited to be a part of a culture. Uh, last time we talked about the historical aspect. Today, I want to talk about food. 
That's how we're going to introduce this topic. We're going to talk about different traditional dishes in Haitian culture. I was going to try to like order some Haitian food, but that's not what I'm feeling tonight for dinner. So I apologize. So maybe next time oh, we could do a virtual. <laughs> I want what my virtual that? free tie. I want my virtual, you know, well, we're going to talk about that. So before I introduce each guest, they're going to tell you what their favorite dish is and kind of describe. Is that peak leaves? Or is that mumba? <laughs> mumba. <laughs> So before we introduce our guests, we're going to quickly talk about Haitian dishes and I want each of our guests to share their traditional favorite Haitian dish with us. And so there is, uh, and some of you all who are not of Haitian descent, but maybe you have friends that are Haitian or you definitely from South Florida, you know about some Haitian food. Uh, of course, the most infamous one is glio, which is fried pork and uh, plantains are bonan. Uh, which means it's like tortillas, like for the Hispanic community. It's flattened uh, uh, right green plantains that are fried. They're soaked in salt water. They are fried. And, you know, we have this uh, spicy cabbage. It's not like a coleslaw. Well, I guess it's like a coleslaw, but it's a spicy coleslaw that we put on, on, our, on our dishes to kind of give it a spicy, tasty flavor. And so it's mixed with vinegar and carrots uh, and, you know, uh, hot, hot peppers and some other things. People kind of put a little bit, have their own variation, but really it's mostly ca cabbage, raw cabbage that's uh, been uh, soaked in vinegar with peppers and carrots, shredded. And so I'm going to go to Captain Haiti. Tell us what is your favorite. Oh, I didn't tell you what my Haitian, well, you go first. I'll be the last one to tell my favorite Haitian dish and then I'll introduce each guest. My favorite dish? Uh, well, I, was, I already showed it to you. It's Mamba Kassav at Glow Secret. Five hours, oh. five hours, is that? Wait, whoa, whoa, Glow Secret? Oh my goodness. Kassav now you gotta break it down for those. Oh, get that kind of That's where I get my superpowers. Oh, goodness. Lord have mercy. You gonna I make spoke me. It. I was serious. <laughs> All right, so explain what that dish is in English. So, those who are not Haitian who are watching, they could understand what you're saying about mamba, okay. kasa. Mamba, it's peanut butter, okay? So it's peanut butter, but the difference is in our peanut butter, we put piment, we put, uh, how do you say piment in English? Peppers. We put peppers in our peanut butter. So it's spicy, it brings out the flavors, right, of uh, the, the, the peanuts, right? And we, uh, how do you say cassava uh, in English? Uh, I don't know. It's like dried leavened bread, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's like a, a dry, uh, flaky uh, moyok. How do you say moyok? Moyok. Okay, come on now. Right, you guys gonna have to learn Creole, yo. I can't describe that dish for you. All right, it's moba, which is peanut butter, cassava, which is uh, and glossy glossy clay. It's sweet water. When you put some water, you put some, <laughs> not not the white sugar. You have to put the brown sugar in it, baby. All right? You put brown sugar. But if you want to go fancy, right, you put a little bit of citron, a little bit of lemon, OK? If you want to go fancy, but you have your cassava, you have your peanut butter, you have your sick rouge, and you have your little citron. What I cannot, I just want to say, I cannot drink sweet water. I cannot drink glossy <laughs> before anything in the world. I don't know. It has a, a weird taste to me. I can't. Really? I mean, I like it if it's like a juice, like a lemon or, you know, orange or some kind of Thank fruit you. In it, but Thank not you. just water and sugar. It's the, it's the Haitian peanut butter for me. I don't it's think the Haitian I, peanut butter? Okay. I don't really like it like that. <laughs> I, that's one thing I prefer Americans. <laughs> Here's the thing. All and three of them have to be together. <laughs> All right, what? Melissa. Melissa, tell um, us what is your favorite Haitian dish? My favorite Haitian dish. I want to emphasize on the fact that I do not like to eat. I don't oh. like to eat. I don't care about food. Bye -bye. Oh, she's That's not Haitian. Cool. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know. It's something about me. I'm really sexy. That's why. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he will go days without eating, and I forget to eat. Oh my goodness. Like when I'm bleeding, my jam best journey. I'm messy. They will choose you. If I have to choose one, just one, I would say 
spaghetti avec un sort, avec des boules. I think, I think like, this is one thing I miss from my childhood and I'm going to say it in English as well. It is pasta made with Alan I don't think it's herring. herring. It's herring. 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 I don't think it's the same thing as the Alan Because when you say the Alan you like, you feel like it's Alan But <laughs> well, we try to eggs. translate for our American uh, non Haitian <laughs> With eggs and banana and banana, big banana. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. So Sarah already shared with us. We have Monica on here. Monica. Hi. Hello, my <laughs> love. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Tell us what is your favorite Haitian traditional dish? I don't know. I mean, lately, I've really just been feeling that dewy sauce bar and legume. It just <laughs> hits right. Like, it hits every taste bud. Oh, God. Sorry. She's like an old grandma. <laughs> Sauce bar. Okay, what kind of sauce bar do you like? And you got to translate in English for those I like, that. I like the blue. I like the black beans. I like the rice with the black beans. Yeah. Okay, and so what is legume? Uh, I don't, is it like mixed vegetables? vegetables? Mixed it's vegetables. Like two vegetables. Vegetables, vegetables. vegetables too? No. Uh. Mix. Yeah, mixed two vegetables. So it has like eggplant. It has cabbage. It has carrots. Uh, some people put meat in it, and they'll put crab, or they'll put beef. How do you uh, say militon? militon uh, in English? Oh, uh, coyote? Militon. No, I think it's coyote, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I believe it's a uh, coyote. Coyote. Or... I think so, too. Um, I can't remember. One, one thing I want to say, um, for Manika that says she likes um, sauce bois noir, I would advise trying sauce bois blanc with meat oh. in it cooking oh. the sauce bois blanc with the meat oh. it's called cassoulet this is the one thing i fell in love with before i left i said you don't eat <laughs> <laughs> this this is something else right you said it's, it's called cassoulet cassoulet yes it's white um it's white beans it's navy beans navy beans thank you because oh. I'm, I'm haitian haitian y'all like the haitian is in me <laughs> Um, like one in eat cooked in it, so it's just it does something. Mine you know? is green sauce pois with the pigeon pigeon no. peas with sugar. Uh, that's sugar. been a long time. Sugar. I haven't had that in so long. That is what I'm talking about. But let's move on to Ashley. Ashley, tell us what's your favorite traditional dish. Hey everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. So my favorite traditional dish is something that we have once a year. And it's, I love it so much. You go for Suzumo. Don't say it, don't say it. <laughs> like, I'm out of time right now, and I to, I know we have to eat it only in January, but I told you. No, you no. only have to eat it in January. <laughs> I love it so much. Like, that's one of my I, favorite. I and think I prefer bouillon. No, I don't like bouillon. I really I don't. Like, I actually like bouillon. Who I said they it. like bouillon? I love bouillon. Please. I love bouillon. You got the boy slash dumb boy yeah. in there. You oh, got put the boy in it. Yes. Make me some yeah. dumb boy. Wait, 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 wait. So actually explain to those, because remember, we have non-Haitians watching, so we want to be mindful. We want to be culturally sensitive. Okay. <laughs> and sharing our beautiful culture. So actually break down what is soup jumo, my love. Soup jumo is like a pumpkin squash soup. Mm -hmm. And it has beef in it with noodles. It has vegetables such as um, celery. It has carrots. It's some fey. I don't know what it's called. It's some like a fey. Um, it's and spinach. You put spinach in it. Potatoes. Um, what else? What else can you put in there? I know there's. Um, it's the, the did noodles, you put the pasta? The, the noodles. Long noodles. The long noodles. It's like a long noodle. Spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. Spaghetti. <laughs> yes, I see stuff with goat heads in it. More, I see that more in bouillon too. Yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. Right. I think that sums it up. But I also like to have, because you know, during the holiday season, they have something on the side that goes with the soup jumu, and it's the um, te je jum. Mm -mm. Oh, mm -mm. Ah, bread. Oh, she's you gotta dip it in the yeah. bread. Oh, no. no. Did she just pull out the bread? <laughs> yes, yeah, she did. She's <laughs> 
Yes. Why did no? You know, you can't if you're not willing to share your Haitian bread, you cannot pull it out. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. So I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, who's putting out the bread? Wait, who's putting out the bread? <laughs> Let me see that bread. You late, you late, you late, uh -oh. you late. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you guys something funny. So, like, I was, I'm going out, I'm at my sister's house right now. She's in Texas. And I kid you not, my parents loaded ginger root and a whole bunch of pack of Haitian breads to put in my mallet. So it was like <laughs> nearly 50 pounds because of all the stuff. It's embarrassing, you know? Like when you go to the TSA and you, they, they're like, probably yeah. like, what's going on in there, you know? Definitely but, understand. <laughs> hey, listen, yeah, I'll tell you something. I have a, a client, she contacted me uh, last week. She paid $55, right? To have uh, one more bag, two bag of Haitian breads, and some John John and a box. She said, yo, I'll pay for shipping. Her shipping was like $22. I'm like, yeah, you're gonna pay that? Said, yeah, yeah, I want it. She's just in North Carolina. Yeah, so, North Carolina, I used to live in North Carolina. There's not much there. Why <laughs> get to parents? So they loaded you like a mule, right? Hey, yo, hey, I think you skipped over me. You didn't ask me what my favorite dish you was. You spoke, my love. No, I just said that I did like Haitian um, peanut butter. But oh, if I had to one, it, okay, there's so many good things. You'll be the last one. Go ahead, my love. There's so many um, good dishes that we have. Um, but I believe my favorite one would have to be pate kode. Oh no, I love it. Not. No, I love no. it so okay. much. I think we gotta move on. So this is supposed to be an icebreaker. <laughs> Listen, it's so flaky. You put the hot dog, you put some like pickles in it. Like, what? yes, I love hot dogs. I do. Oh. I don't like, I really don't like our salt. But if my mom puts like some hot dogs in it, like it's amazing. No, what you need is the pate cotte with the zebui inside of it. Yes, yes, yes. Without the zebui, it's not pate cotte anymore. It's just pate. Yes, yes. Like, it's so much. Well, let's get this party started. That was supposed to be our icebreaker talking about uh traditional dishes as last time we were on we talked about the the the, the geographical uh country the geograph geography of the country and gave a little history some knowledge but let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker martin nandy is the creator of, of captain haiti game app before being known as captain haiti martin was the founder and ceo of cafe Goudou in Quebec and now the manager of KeepItHaitian.com, a network that helped local Haitian products and restaurants around the world after a successful career helping telecommunication corporations increase their market share in Canada and running his own direct marketing agency. Martin now invests his talent in so social entrepreneurism. This serial entrepreneur also helps Haitian farmers fight poverty by developing a new market for their produce. And so I'm gonna mute everybody now, except Captain Haiti, so we can have a dialogue. Yes, doctor. One second. So we can have a dialogue talking about, um, well, I guess everybody else muted themselves. Uh, so we can have a dialogue. So Martin, uh, Captain Haiti, sorry. Yeah. Last yes, time you were on, you came on as a Martin Nandy, and we talked. We were talking about businesses. We were talking about your perspective of doing business in Haiti and what that looks like from a remote perspective. As we had others talking about actually being in Haiti. So uh, this time around, we really want to talk about what is the future of businesses in Haiti, locally and abroad. Uh, the the future of the local business in Haiti is abroad, okay? Because we speak English, we speak French, we speak Spanish, and we are in contact with other cultures. These cultures, um, to, to, to make my point, Sam, uh, to make my point, I'm gonna tell you a story. I was selling coffee in Montreal. And when I speak over the, uh, when I speak over the phone in Montreal, you think I'm a white, uh, French Canadian, right? Because I'm born and raised there. But when I started to sell coffee, I will accentuate my French to have a Haitian accent. Why? Because my authenticity will sell more Haitian coffee. 
But if I would go and just try to sell a cell phone or anything else to them white people, they wouldn't buy it from me. Even though I will speak like their language, etc., they will buy it, but I will be an average salesman, okay? All that to say that we have a gift. Our gift is our authenticity. The fact that we are Haitian. And when we look, I was talking to a business owner today, and she was mentioning that as Haitians, we, we can't just start Haitian businesses for Haitians. We have to start Haitian businesses for other uh, demographic as well, sell to others. And I agree with her, but one thing that we have to understand, the others, they don't buy from you. They don't even buy from each other. I'll give you an example. If an Arab wants to buy a TV, he ain't gonna go to the Chinese. He's gonna go to the Arab. The Chinese wants to buy a house. He ain't gonna go to a, an Italian or a Greek. He's gonna find a Chinese because in their culture, and this is something that we have to address, you know, as Haitians, uh, and all other cultures, they take you go crazy by buying from other people, by giving your money to somebody else. This is something that is unconceivable for them. Again, being born and raised in Montreal, all my friends are from everywhere around the world, okay, that I grew up with. But when you deal with them, they compete to drag to have the next party to one of their restaurants or to one of uh, their nightclubs or to visit one of their institutions, right? Because they keep the money within their community. The only way that an Arab is going to buy from a Chinese or a Chinese from a Greek, an Italian from a Japanese, is when they want to experience their culture. So as an Arab, I ain't going to buy Chinese from a French guy. I'm going to buy Chinese from a Chinese when I want to experience the Chinese. And I'm going to top my top dollars to experience that Chinese and add to my culture. This is what we are missing. As Haitians, we have to, and when I say that locally, the, the local business in Haiti is abroad. We are the representative of these businesses. What is the experience? What is the adventure that we can provide to these people, to the world, when it comes to Haiti? Whatever product that we have, okay? These products, we, we just talked about Mamba. We just talked about Haitian food, etc. right? Well, they want to experience the food. They don't, you know, they believe mainstream media and they think that Haiti is so unstable, etc. So they are scared to go to Haiti. No problem. That represents an opportunity for us to bring Haiti to them versus uh, little Haiti. Uh, I would like to, and if anybody wants to chime in, you can unmute yourself. Um, but my challenge to you is when we look at other cultures, we look at the Jamaican culture, we look at the, Haiti, uh, the, the Hispanic culture, uh, and uh, even though it's a diaspora, but let's look at it as, let's say the Hispanic uh, culture is one, just for this conversation. We know that there's, mm -hmm. it's multiple countries, so it's a different, it's not, it's not apples and apples, it's apples and oranges. Yes. I think I would like to say what that person said is that we do sell to our own and that's, that's no problem. But the other thing is, I think when we are so closed-minded that we only sell to our own, that we miss out two opportunities. We miss out the opportunity to expand financially, and we also miss out the opportunity to educate people and expose them to our culture. Yes. And the reason why I say that is when you look at Little Haiti, how many of non-Haitians shop in Little Haiti on a regular basis? Not oh. including tourists. Listen, it's very rare. Very, very rare. Yeah. But let's go to Little Havana. And, and we're talking about my South Florida for those that are watching that are not from Florida. We're talking about uh, South Florida because one, we're, most of us are from there, or reside there. And two, when you look at the pockets of these cultural communities, there's a big population of the Hispanic community. There's a big population of the Jamaican, the Caribbean community. There's a big population of the Haitian community compared to other parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. so if you look at, you know, Little Havana, there still may be a big population of Hispanics on a regular shopping there, but they're still shopping there because when you have a Presidente, I used to live in North Miami off 125th. Where Presidente is located, it's not a big Hispanic community. It's a big Haitian community. Yes. You're shopping there. 
even though Publix is maybe not even two, three blocks away from Presidente. And you know, so I think the challenge is too, and I had a conversation with somebody about this, is that we have to, what happened to our supermarkets, our yeah. pharmacies, our universities? And I know there are some that are there. We have a few colleges and universities locally, but I'm saying to the magnitude that we can make a difference. When you look at the Hispanic community, I can name at least three or four universities off that, and they're not only serving Hispanic community. You know, when we look at their supermarkets, we look at the, there's Navarro Pharmacy. You know, there's another supermarket, Sobraro's. You have Sedona's. I don't even, what's Sedona's? What's that? Is that a supermarket? Okay, so there's different, they have different entities that are, they're selling outside of their culture. And I think that's what we need to do because when I, when I first came back to South Florida, well, well, I would say Miami, I would go and I couldn't even use a credit card in these businesses. I had to carry cash. I don't carry cash. You will rarely find me ca carry cash. Only time I have cash in my pocket is if somebody's giving me that cash or I need to make a transaction that I've already made preparation to carry cash. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of challenges when we look at Haitian businesses, how we conduct ourselves, our operating process. And not only that, the mom and pop stores. We look at franchise. The only franchise that I could think of that is Haitian is Chef Creole. Yes. Yes. There's, there's another university. There's Azul College. It, it is a yeah. university. They have MBA programs, etc. No, no, I know, but there's only one or two, and it's not on a bigger scale compared to, I can yes. name a couple Hispanic universities, you yes. know, that are yes. locally. So there is Azura College, there's uh, Day Tech Technology or something like that. So there's mm -hmm. a few of them. But, you know, to the point that when are we moving the needle beyond our community and actually making a financial economic impact to where we are located instead of being a burden? Uh, um, you're 100% you're, you're right. One thing, uh, one of the reasons why I don't go to meetings, uh, like community meetings and uh, organizations, etc. I'm like, hey, listen, man. I don't have time to waste, all right? You guys want to talk about these big structures or we should do this, we should do that. What about the money in your pocket, okay? When you have to buy a loaf of bread or, or you just mentioned Presidente, right? Uh, yesterday it was raining. I'd rather walk, okay, there's the corner store right here. I'd rather walk under the rain to bring that money to Mr. Louis and a mom and pop store in Little Haiti than go to the little store right here. Why? because he has to get my money. So when it comes to the money in our pocket, what do we do with, with it? Because if you don't, in, in Montreal, we have, uh, the, the Italians is a big community, right? They have their own and, uh, hospital, they call it Santa Caprini. And one day I, I met a, a young um, Haitian girl, and I, I, young Haitian girl, I met a Haitian girl and I told her, what do you want to do? I want to be a nurse. Okay, perfect. Where do you want to work? Well, I want to work in St. Luc or Santa Capine. He said, what if in 20 years from now, we'll have a third option to work for the uh, Desalines Hospital or the Toussaint Louverture Hospital? He said, well, I don't want to be a nurse to work in a Haitian hospital. I want to be a nurse to work in a hospital. One thing, um, one thing I want to say based on that, and I am speaking from my own experience, I was born and raised in Haiti. That means I am pure Haitian and this might come off in a certain way, but I don't even identify as Haitian American right now because I am still bluntly Haitian. But there is an issue with our Haitian people when it comes to the money goes to Haitian. It would be my pleasure to provide that money to Haitian businesses, to provide it to my brothers and my sisters because it stays within us but we have a customer service issue that we need to address. I am at work um, for my job. We always cater food, um, cater food every first Friday. And as we're catering food, my boss, we, who is not even Haitian, she's Brazilian. She wanted to cater food from um, a Haitian restaurant. Personally, I was not a fan of it. I didn't want to and we're gonna see why. When we called the Haitian restaurant, that was the first place we called. They told us to call one hour later. One hour later, we called them, they tell us another hour because it's still breakfast. Keep in mind, it's 11.30 in the morning. We want to order lunch so we can get it on time. 
1130, they tell us one hour. After one hour, when we call them, the lady said, oh, we don't have any food available. We said, what do you mean you don't have any food? She said, that's what they told me. Um, that's not my job. I don't have to explain anything to you. We don't got food. So you are telling me that as a Haitian person, I am very big on customers. I am so sorry if you don't have customers. And I'm very big on time management and people following their words. And okay, I am not uh, saying, hold that thought. Let me introduce you real quick so they know who's speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is <laughs> Melissa Lucien. She is born and raised in Haiti. She moved to Florida at the age of five and it currently serves as the first ever, y'all hear me ladies and gentlemen, the first ever Miss Haiti, Florida 2020. Can we get virtual class please? <laughs> Thank you. you know what, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna have to mute y'all. No. <laughs> No, but I do want to emphasize. Um, no, I'm here. not done, my love. Let me finish it. Oh, you're not done? No, but I moved here five years ago. Not five I years know, ago, I'm going to finish reading your bio. Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> Listen. Glory, help us, Lord. <laughs> so from her inspirational videos to her writing, she is an unwearing promoter of self-love, woman empowerment, and making one's passion a paycheck. She finds her purpose in positively impacting the life of individuals so they themselves can become agents of change in our communities, in our countries, and in our world, making it a better place. Now you can finish your thoughts. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think it's very big to understand that when I am paying somebody, I'm giving you my money, I am paying for a service. I'm not paying because you're Haitian. I'm paying because you are good at what you do. So to me, it is there's a very thin line between Haitians feeling comfortable because, oh, Haitians are going to come spend money on my business and having a bad customer service. Because I do not care where somebody is from. If I go to that Hispanic and the Hispanic is giving me a better service, even if they're not doing the job better, but the customer service, the fact that I feel like you care, the way that you talk to me, the way that you address me, makes me want to come back. But if I go to you, you're telling me, I ain't got to explain anything to you. Yes, you do, because I am paying you my money for it. I am. I work hard for my money. So I don't I know if I should care. ask you the name of this restaurant, but hold that thought. <laughs> hold that thought, because you know, I want us to dispel this myth that every black business every Haitian business has bad customer service. I can name some restaurants that I will go to religiously. I could tell you Pierre's Caribbean restaurant off uh, 7th, Northwest 7th Avenue and about 111, 111th Street Northwest, right across from Winn-Dixie. I go there faithfully. I could tell you about Casa Champette in uh, Pembroke Pines, University yeah. and Pembroke Pines. Awesome customer service. But the other thing five. too, huh? Three or five. Well, I don't know. I, I, well, you can say that one. I don't know that one. I've never been there. But I will tell you recently, I want to give a shout out to Caribbean on, wait, hold on. Let me make sure I say it correctly. One second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Caribbean grocery. Carib if I can spell Caribbean right. One second. Caribbean. Caribbean Online Grocery, located somewhere in West Palm. I'll say Lake Worth area. Mm -hmm. I purchased, you know, one item, less than $20. I'll say less than 15, to be real. Less than $15. I ordered it. They give local delivery for free. So I said, okay, you know, I'm gonna try to keep my little change to myself. So I said, local delivery. Remind you, they're coming from Lake Worth. They drive all the way to my primary residence in Broward. I was not home. They called me, they say, Ms. Delica, we're here in front of your residence. No one is home, we need to, we're here to deliver your package. I said, well, I'm at work, try my post office. Cause I'm thinking, because I ordered it, I'm thinking they have a package label and everything like that. So they could just drop it off at the post office and the post office will put it in my PO box. So they drove from Broward all the way to Miami Shores. Damn. Try to deliver my package. They they call me back and say the post office will not receive it because there is no USPS postage on it. Damn. 
So I said, all right, I apologize. The only other option is if you come near downtown Miami to deliver me this package. I said, but yet, better yet, I'm gonna be off for the next day or two. Let's rearrange something. The next day they call me. Ms. Delica, we're ready to deliver your package. Are you at your primary residence? I said, yes. So I'm like, okay, I just got off work. I'm gonna go to sleep. They can put the package in front of my door. When I wake up, I will pick it up. So something, I woke up and in waking up, uh, the package was not there. And I'm like, okay, I see it because I told them to text me when they drop off the package. So I see the text. And so I go out to my front door and I text the guy. I said, hey, I don't see my package. He was like, yeah, the driver was there, but they knocked on the door and nobody was home. And I said, well, sir, I did explain to you that I work at night, I will be sleeping. They could just leave the package in front of my door. I will pick it up when I wake up. My community is very safe. Sometimes my packages stay two, three days. Well, let me not say that because somebody might go to Oh, yeah, house. what's your address? <laughs> my, my neighbor has cameras and I do too. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so I'm on the phone. I guess it's the owner. So we're back and forth. He makes the driver come back to wow. my house. This is about a five minutes, five minutes after the driver has left my place. He comes back, delivers me the package, and I had only one beef with them. I said, I went to your website. The only reason why I continue to purchase the, the product that I needed is because I could not find it any place else. But I said, in order for me to continue patronizing with you, you have, a, I see some Caribbean flag on there, but one is missing. I said, I don't see no Haitian flag. I'm not doing business with you. If you want me to do business with you, you need to put up the Haitian flag. So of course I quickly got an email or a text to say, explain it to me that they provide Sac Passe products. I said, that's great you provide the products. But once I go to the website and I don't see a Haitian flag that you put other Caribbean flags and you service them, I want my community to know that you service them as well quickly by seeing the flag on where you display the yes. other flag. Done deal. Nice. Not only did they do that, not only I didn't get no attitude, I didn't get you made us drive here, here, and there. I didn't get no delivery charge because remind you, they're coming all the way from um, West Palm area, down the south, the, down the South Broward area. What what company is that? Caribbean Online Grocery. So I want everybody to patronize them because when we're talking about business uh, customer service for businesses. I told him, hands I even blessed the man. I said, I'm gonna speak a blessing over your business because I'm just impressed. And not only that, they gave me a store credit afterwards. Oh, yeah. okay. Do you, so, do, you, do you see what I mean, Phil? Do you see the dip? You see the difference, right? And like, it's just, it is, to me, not all of them were the same. Correct. But one bad experience will ruin it for everybody else, for every right. other. And it's important right. for, learn from each other, teach each other. Because to me, this is one business that we need, a business that teach businesses customer service. Because but it can they afford it? That's the challenge because Nandy tried to do something different. I've tried to do something different within our community. Mm -hmm. You know, the challenge is you're looking at an older population. Uh, they don't have the economic capacity, probably. They're barely trying mm -hmm. to keep their doors open. They don't That's take credit cards because they said because of fraud and the charges for credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of challenges that our older generation um, experience when it comes to businesses. Because if you go in Little Haiti, very rarely would you find a younger person in business in Little Haiti. It's generally an older population that's been around way before credit cards, well, I'm not gonna say that. You know, way before technology picked up a notch. So, Can you I know, ask, go ahead. Um, okay, if I can bring a, a better understanding, okay, without explaining, is uh, fire, Dr. Delica just mentioned it, it's a lack of capital, okay? Um, when you buy from a Haitian business, you don't buy, you invest, okay? in that business because very often um, we don't have enough money to start the business or to employ the proper person. Like when you say, oh, I want to, I wanted to buy, uh, I wanted the, the restaurant to cater, let's say there's 15 of us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, many of these restaurants, they only had enough money to buy stock for, let's say, 85 people in the morning. So mm -hmm. once they, because they don't have any cash flow. So once they buy, get that money they get for 85, the, the profit that they made 
this morning, they're going to run again to buy some more stuff. I, I'm Why you tell you, my I parents business? <laughs> yeah, I have clients from uh, from different restaurants, and one of them, well, he was like, anyways, I don't want to get into too much detail because it, it, it will get too long, but uh, Santa Fe is, it, it's, it's called, not called a PSA, right? So the real, there, there's a, I remember in my youth in Montreal, there's this uh, supermarket, the name was Denver, okay? By the name, you know, it's a Jewish supermarket. Here's what they did. And I always put things in perspective when it comes to businesses with, with Stanberg. And the beginning of Stanberg, if you are a Jew, they will charge you 10% more on your bill at the beginning wow. of the business. They charge you 10% more. If you're white, Asian, or whatever, they won't charge you more. But the, the Jew will gladly pay 10% more. But after that, you know what they did? What they establish, if you're a Jew, then they give you a membership card, and that membership card only Jews had it because they will sell it at the synagogue. Listen, if you're a Jew, you get 6% less because that 10% allowed them to establish themselves and better serve other communities in order to bring back and give back to their communities. So mm -hmm. as Haitians, I always see that we have, like when we go to a Haitian restaurant, I mean, I tip them. I tip them way more. Well, my love is to all that moon, but she pay up and came a couple of them by another to life. I do have a question though. Uh -huh. Captain but, Yes. Um, you mentioned lack of capital. So with, for me, like based off observation, like you have Dutch pot, right? And Donna's Caribbean food. So that's a chain of Jamaican Jamaican restaurants. It's a right? franchise, yeah. Franchise. So I would talk to a few of my friends and we would go to Dutch Pot, we'll buy some food or whatnot. And it's like so many different Dutch Pot locations and they're doing very well. Their business is very great. And I'm just like, why don't we have like that Haitian restaurant that's like booming, like that's franchising um, the business and all that. So would it be lack of capital or would it be lack of vision? Cause in little Haiti, it's like, there's this pack supermarket. They have, um, uh, they sell like chicken wings and all of that type of stuff. And you see like even the, the, the non-Haitians would come there. The lines are always long. It's like people really love it. So like, do they have that vision to where it's just like, oh, we should probably, you know, start, a, a, open up a new location and stuff like that. I would want to see that in the Haitian community that we do have that. I mean, we do have Chef Creole, but like, yeah many more that's a great question you know it's it's not their position to have a vision their position was to start it up okay their position is to say okay you know what i'm gonna get this brick and i'm gonna get this business this restaurant right here the next generation that's your responsibility to take what have what is what is there and bring it to another level. Because starting off something and surviving it over five years, that's an exploit in itself, okay? Once the business is there, then you come in and you have an opportunity. You know what? What did you want to do? Oh, mommy, uh, when you tell this young woman, tell, 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 okay, mommy, this is what needs to happen now. So, and and in every community, there's that challenge, right? Because when I used to be a, a consultant for small businesses, uh, their biggest challenge is because they, uh, baby boomers, they didn't make children. So a lot of their businesses were getting bought by whom? By immigrants. And it was a problem. They had to make a study about it. How come uh, white, uh, uh, white uh, French Canadians, white French Canadian businesses were getting by, bought by other cultures? And for them, it was unacceptable only to realize that's because they're the next generation weren't attending the business. They sent them to college, right? Or they had their own profession and they, did, they didn't have, see value in the business. And it was a society problem in Canada and uh, uh, Quebec. So they had to address it. So it's not that because it's a lack of vision, okay? It's, it's really, it's their position. Now it's, hours to bring up that vision and bring it to another level. 
And I want you to hold that thought, Captain Haiti. Let's go ahead and move to Miss Haiti, Florida, Melissa, as she is going to talk about uh, the impact. Uh oh, there we go. Thought I lost you guys. She is going to talk about uh, the impact of media, entertainment. How does that help to preserve the Haitian culture? How can that move this agenda that we've been discussing about uh, whether it's talking about the business platforms, whether it's talking about educating people about the Haitian culture? So, Melissa, we want to turn the conversation over to you. What is your thought as you know, you use media for a lot of different things? Um, how do you think that this new this uh, this new generation of Haitian Americans, the future of Haiti. How does the media uh, realm play? Our media space play in that. Okay, so first, say hi to everybody that's watching or listening. <laughs> it is a pleasure for me to be here, and I thank you, Dr. Ferrella, for thinking of me. It is a pleasure. As I stated, as Dr. Paola stated, I was born and raised in Haiti. Um, I'm here five years. So yes, just come. If you're Haitian, you know. Um, to me, the media is, again, one thing that we all know, it is a powerful tool. It is a tool that we can use to educate, build, and empower people. At the same time, it is a tool that we can use to destroy people, to destroy a community, to destroy a country. With Haiti, from what I have been seeing, I have been seeing a lot of negative connotations, negative pictures, negative images of our country. But I want to emphasize one thing. There is the positive and there is the negative. I lived in Haiti. I lived and experienced both. I was grateful enough to move to the United States at an age where I could analyze things. And from my many analysis from working and meeting people and listening to different people and also looking at the projection that the media has, the United States of America, just like Haiti, it has positives and negatives. Now my issue is the way when it comes to millennials and us, the younger generation, when we look at Haiti, we have two group of millennials lately, especially Haitian millennials. We have the group that is, oh, um, Haiti is so not good. Haiti, I don't even want to go to Haiti. I don't want to visit Haiti. I don't see why people are so proud to be Haitian. And this past May 18, this was actually a conversation on Twitter because some Haitian young people, they felt the need to go on Twitter and say, hey, oh, today is May 18. I don't see why Haitian want to make a big deal out of it. I was mesmerized. And these are Haitian, um, they're not, honestly, they're not even Haitian American. They're Haitian. Like I'm talking about Haitian, Haitian, born and raised in Haiti, but they had the opportunity to travel and visit the United States because of their economical status, economical class, which nothing wrong with that. But you see a lack of patriotism, which doesn't make sense to me. But at the same time, you have this other group of people that go on social media and that are like, oh my God, Haiti is perfect. Haiti is great. I don't see why people are posting bad things about Haiti. And again, there is this other young lady that wrote a whole poem about Haiti and how it is safe to go to Haiti and how when people say it is unsafe to go to Haiti, it is just an excuse. I was pissed. I was so mad and aggravated when she posted that because I have friends in Haiti. I still have friends that attend schools in Haiti. And it breaks my heart when I get to answer the phone or just see the text messages of my friends in Haiti telling me I'm scared to go to school because I'm scared of getting raped. I'm scared to go to school because you are killing people for no reason. And when you sit down and you say, oh, Haiti's perfectly fine, you can travel to Haiti, you are disrespecting the life of these people there. You are disrespecting the truth that they are leaving. I am not saying Haiti is not a good country, but I am saying that it is our job as the new generation to use social media to promote Haiti on a good light, but also educate each other and 
be acknowledged educated about what is truly going on in our country because let's be realistic unless you know what is going on you cannot make a change i'm not saying for us to go on social media and promote haiti as a bad country but what i want us to say is haiti has very beautiful beaches haiti has an amazing culture very well coming people amazing food but haiti has an issue that we need to address so haiti how are you using your platform sorry i didn't mean to cut you off how are you going to use this platform as the first ever in history <laughs> of this pageant system as Miss Haiti Florida, as you are, you know, you a blogger with Haitians who blog, you know, you do your own social media thing. I see a TV show or some kind of podcast yes. coming next. So I'm just going to speak that right over your life right now. But yes. you know, how are you using this influence? How are you using your pageantry? How are you going to help make that shift? Because, you know, one of the challenges I think is we can identify what we see on social media, whether we agree with it or not. But, you know, we don't want the bystander effect. We're not, we're not going to wait for the next person to make that change. So what are you going to do with, with this energy that I see coming from you uh, in talking about this topic? What are you going to do to have Melissa be a change maker, to have Melissa be a history maker when it comes to impacting that area of our culture? Um, to me, the biggest thing, as I said, is educating people. It is my job. Like, I take it personally. When I go to an event, when I am somewhere, or even on social media, where people are literally dropping, excuse my French and no disrespect to anybody, but pure ignorance about a country that they know nothing about. So I mainly educate people from my perspective as a young Haitian woman growing up in Haiti and a young Haitian American woman coming here and making it to college and living both realities, educating people. The second thing um, to me is representing Haiti. It is my job, it is my duty for when somebody see me, and I have heard it so many times when people see me, they're like, when did you move here? And I'm like, five years ago, they're like, no way, yes way. There are people in Haiti that are well-rounded there are people in Haiti receiving the education that you would never think. Some of them crack on us yet. No, that's my aunt. But <laughs> I tried to avoid it, but it was like getting louder. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, oh. To Auntie, we need a plate too, okay? Whatever she eating. <laughs> I will let her know. Um, but there is this big that I am changing the stigma just by the life that I am living, just mm -hmm. by the things that I am doing. And when it comes to my friends in Haiti, you would not believe me if I tell you that I am literally actively looking for jobs for them. I have one of my mentors that um, she graduated from Harvard and she had a group of people that went to Haiti and they have a program in Haiti for young people, for the youth, and they are looking for people to hire. Guess what I do? These people I went to school with and they graduated college already, I go to them and I say, hey, um, who's looking for a job? Because we still have group chats. We still keep in touch with each other. And who need a job? You need a job? Okay, perfect. I make the connection. And I tell them straight up, because yes, I care about you, but this is my accreditation on the line. So you cannot mess up because if you mess up, you're blocking the line for everybody else that's coming after you. And mm -hmm. some of them, I'm making connections with people in Haiti. One of them, she's in medical school. And I have friends that are doctors in Haiti, and I call them, hey, I have somebody in medical school. You might not be able to give her a job, but can you get her an internship so she can get the experience? So once she's ready to get a job, she can get it. If she get an opportunity to go somewhere. So this is me doing my part. I might not be there, but how can I help you? So not only I am making the change in you, but I am also making the difference in the country. And a big thing for me, and this is one of my biggest projects that I cherish so much, is going back to Haiti and having a youth program where it is a networking event where professionals from Haiti, the United States, that want to go, Canada as well, if you want to go to Haiti to empower the youth, because I feel like the change is in the youth, like you said. And with every single one of us in Haiti, there is a... Yes, there is education. We have a good educational system, but there is a blockage where kids, youth, young people 
they are not exposed to the different realities. They are not exposed to the different career opportunities. They're just, you know, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a nurse, but we can engineer. only Don't have the engineers. So many, exactly. We can only have so many doctors. If you have one city that is, let's say, 100 people, and you have 20 doctors, then the doctors are not even making enough money that they should be making because there are not even enough people there. So to me, it's bringing this different perspective, the different opportunities. And my goal is um, once these entrepreneurs, businessmen, professionals, intellectuals go there, they get to talk to these kids and they get to come up and tell them, this is what I want to accomplish. How can I get there? What is your tip? What is your best tip? How do you advise me and even invest in me? Like you said, it's investing in each other. So for these people to actually go there and invest in the youth, because if you do not invest in the youth, you can be going to Haiti every week. But what are you doing? You're just investing in JetBlue, American Airlines, and the government. Nothing against the government, but honestly. So I know it's a lot, but... No oh. worries, no worries. Hold that thought. Did somebody want to re uh, have a comment before we move on? Because I wanted to go to our next speaker. Well, I, I, I found you very inspiring. Thank you, thank you. Do you want to add something else, Captain Haiti? <laughs> I'm trying not to monopolize the clock. Okay, the no worries. So we'll move right along. I'm sorry, it's Because she no, that's said okay. that, that got me going. Okay, it's the one No, no, thing no, no, no. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Stay right there. Don't move. Don't, don't move. Don't move. Let's go ahead and go to our next speaker because I want us to have enough time uh, right. to have the okay. panel discussion afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next speaker, Jadine Lusan. She has come with her wonderful contestant of Miss Transform Me IT. So before they uh, get to have the floor to have a dialogue, um, let me just read uh, Miss Lusan's bio. She is a Miami native whose daily mantra is too much is given, much is required. Her background in mentorship, devotion to Christ, and passion to transform lives helps this vision come to life. Depending what season of the year it is, you can view the young ladies in the program compete for a scholarship at the Miss Transfer Me IET pageant or go to Haiti for the annual school drive distribution. In the end, she wants to leave the legacy of empowering one mind, one life, in one city at a time. JD! Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you Good again. Um, Glad to have you. Thank you for having safe. us again. You, we actually behaved last time, so you asked us to come back again. And of course, we brought some friends. Hello, Captain yes. Haiti. I see you and your gear. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to begin right now because as I listen to Melissa talk, um, I mean, it's joy in the overflow because I. I get to say I knew Melissa before she became Miss Flor uh, Miss Florida Haiti for Haiti Florida uh -huh. um, because she actually was one of our contestants for uh, 2018 and so just to see how each one reached one uh, what we were able to do and and how we were able to prepare her for this platform she is speaking from her heart she's speaking from my heart this is why I sit before you today again my name is Jadine. Lausanne, and it just brings me great joy to be here as Nayela has introduced us. And one of the reasons why we're here is because we do believe in the future. We do believe in the youth and we do believe in women. Um, we know the power that women have and what we have done since the beginning of time. Um, if you guys want to get a little um, snippet, just go to Genesis uh, 3 and um, you see what Eve was able to do, right? Um, but ultimately, um, from that standpoint, we wanted to empower the young ladies specifically of Haitian descent. And so this is where Transform IT comes out of and also So our goal is to um, inspire the young ladies to understand who they are um, from a you know cultural standpoint, understanding the history of Haiti, that Haiti has the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what we want to do is promote the good and the best. And we know that um, from there, we stand on biblical principles in doing so and also giving them entrepreneur skills so that they can start the project that um, the Lord has put on their heart and ultimately go back and give back. So um, without you know further ado, I will let the contestants introduce themselves, but I just want to say hello, Melissa, and I've been seeing Hi. you. I'm trying to keep up with your fabulousness. I'm but trying. Um, 
you know where you you are in my heart you know dearly you know what yes. you mean to me and so of course this is where it says you know you just have to plant that seed and you see how it's blooming so you are blooming right now and um it's thank your you season. and um we're, we're happy to know that we were part of your journey from the beginning before you even got to um, <laughs> the platform you have today Awesome, awesome. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to call the contestants out. Miss Sarah, you are up first. Introduce yourself, your platform, and a quick uh, feedback of, of the of discussion tonight. And for Jadine and, and uh, the contestants, really, it is what is the future of your organizations as each of you are tasked with having a nonprofit? Uh, how will your nonprofit have a global impact? And I mean global impact Let's move beyond the Haitian culture. Let's move beyond the Haitian people. Because one thing is just like if you are a Christian, am I a Christian business owner or am I a business owner that happens to be Christian? It's the same thing as being an owner of a nonprofit. Is my nonprofit a Haitian nonprofit or is it just happen to be that the owner of the nonprofit is Haitian? Hello everyone, my name is Sarah St. Fleur. I'm contestant number three of the Miss Tuscaloosa IET pageant 2020. My platform is health. Um, let me just keep my platform short. But um, I am, I do have uh, type one diabetes um, and also a story stemming from my little cousin who recognized that my grandmother was having her second to last stroke. Um, yeah, so that's what kind of stems me from from getting the idea of me creating a nonprofit organization called Lavni Payin, which I believe that the children is the future, right? And it's definitely the future of the success of our country and all the other countries as well. Uh, so what we would like to do is we will target children of ages 10 through 18, and we will educate them on health and nutrition. A um, few of the things that we will do for them is we will um, teach them how to recognize the common signs and symptoms of uh, common diseases and conditions. Also teach them the importance of nutrition and nutrition for those things. And with those lessons, we will give them essential tools that they should have at the at the home that everybody needs to have at their home. That that's really important, such as water sanitizers such as blood glucose monitors little things such as pill organizers to just overall help them improve the overall health status of their communities and in general their uh, country so with that like it's just with me when i was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes i was lucky enough to like have things such as insurance so I can go to a nutritionist so they can educate me on how to carb count and things that I should eat, should not eat. And not everybody, not everybody is able to afford insurance or given the opportunity to have insurance like through their jobs or anything like that. So what we can do is by, if I can teach the kids simple things that can help them eat better, especially with their, um, with their parents, because uh, with adults, they're pretty much stuck into their old habits anyways. It's kind of hard to change it up. So if I can tell um, the children that, hey, if you put too much, like if you use a lot of salt, then you'll probably increase your high, like, high blood pressure, things as such, like oils, fats, high cholesterol. Maybe when they get to their homes, they could be like, hey, mom, I, 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 heard, I learned in a lesson today, you know, you're using too much oil, maybe like, Dial tea a little bit um, with the salt too much. Maybe we can, when we're frying plantains, maybe not frying them twice. So any little things that they can um, do to help their own parents, especially like what I mentioned before with my cousin, um, she was the only one in the house. And the only reason why she knew about it is because she knew the signs like be fast is because someone at my church like taught it to the group of kids. So if you if we don't teach them, they won't know. And a lot of parents, um, when they go off to work, they leave their uh, kids with the grandparents, well, their parents. So especially with those older individuals, if you never know that that child might be there and something might happen. So it, it means it's like near and dear to my heart. 
and definitely why I would want to start this nonprofit organization. It's not even um, just for Haitian families. I'm just uh, somebody who has an idea who is Haitian, right? And I've seen it within our Haitian community, and I know it um, occurs in different communities as well. So this is something that would help everybody. And Thank I will, you. Yeah. Thank you, my love. All right, let's go to the next contestant. I'm gonna ask you guys to kind of keep it short because uh, we want to be able to have a panel discussion uh, afterwards after each contestant introduce themselves. But thank you, Sarah. The next one is Monika. Monika, are you ready? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so Monika, introduction, your name, uh, your platform and quickly in a short, concise uh, presentation. Tell us how will you take your nonprofit to make a global impact? All right, so my name is Monika Joseph. My platform is Women Empowerment, and I wanted to start a nonprofit called Her Definition because I feel like this is a global problem anywhere. A lot of women have problems defining their own selves, like. They look to social media to define, to define themselves. Their body is not perfect. Their face is not perfect. Nothing about them is perfect. And with my nonprofit organization, I basically want to help them learn how to define themselves using their own flaws and realize that God made them the way they are, they're supposed to be and that he didn't make no mistake because God makes no mistake. And to learn to embrace themselves and stop looking for outside definition to define themselves and instead be able to define themselves to through, through, through Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good job. All right, let's move on to who's next? Who's next? Let me see who's in the lineup. Juna, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh my God. Good evening, ladies. Oh, such beautiful souls. It's amazing to be able to do this. Um, my name is Juna Borgella. Uh, my platform is education. I aspire to open a nonprofit organization called A Work in Progress for the children ages three to 17. Um, I really just want to make a difference and be able to be the change I want to see in the world because the literacy rate in Haiti is 61%. Whereas, you know, in other countries, it's more than 90%. So that's something that we have to realize that's a major problem. And I see that if we can, you know, have an impact in the in the way these people, um, uh, our people, uh, see information because because of the inability to, you know, read, a lot of them don't know their potential and their value and what they can be bring into this world as you know Haitians and our history and stuff like that so I just want to make a difference for the children so we, it has to start with the kids because they're the next generation I want to focus on that so that we can impact them you know one at a time and in doing so impact you know and make a big um difference in the country and at, as a whole so it starts with just one and then we take over the whole country so that's really what I want to do and I look forward to doing that um have a great night Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Don't go nowhere. This is just the introduction part, just so we can get the conversation going. Sina, are you in the house? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, good evening. So go ahead, introduce yourself. Tell us about your pageantry platform and how your nonprofit organization will make a global impact and keep it short and concise. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sina Levy. Contestant number one, my platform, I'm from Gagua, and my platform is environment. I basically, what I want to do with my platform is open a nonprofit or organization. And what we'll do is um, basically focus on recycling because we know our country environmental problem right now. So, um, what my organization will do is like give the community like garbage i say that containers where they can put their garbage in and um we will like pick it up and pick up the trash technically um clean the community if that makes sense and i believe that's a global problem too because um when that also can impact the ocean and the 
I don't know how to say that, but yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say much. That's basically That's about it. All right, Miss Cena, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Last but not least, Miss Ashley, are you ready? Are you in the house? I am here. Good evening, everyone. Just don't take out the bread again, okay? Because I haven't eaten dinner yet. So oh, I'm sorry, I promise. <laughs> Go ahead, introduce yourself, talk about your pageantry platform and how we'll make a global impact and keep it short and concise. Not a problem. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ashley Demostein. I'm contestant number seven, running for Miss Transform EIT 2020. And my platform is environment. The reason why I'm tackling this is this is because um, the last, the past time that I went to Haiti, um, I noticed trash everywhere. And I wanted, I wanted to say I'm like a tree hugger, but when it comes to pollution and um, clean water, it just irks my soul. So from the last visit, I just told myself mentally that I would have to um, disregard the background noise. I do apologize. But um, I told myself mentally that I would have to make a change. So now that I have an opportunity to do it, my nonprofit organization is called Nitwai. Just a moment, you guys, sorry. Okay. Sorry, that was my nephew. But my nonprofit organization is called Nitoya PAIET. And um, it's, it is, we're taking a step at a time. So the first thing that we'll have to tackle is cleaning up the waterways and um, get, picking up the trash. So I will introduce workshops to um, school curriculums called Nitoya PAIET um, workshops. It will teach the children how to clean up, how to pick up, how to sweep how to um, do like minor cleanup that will make a big impact in the community. So we'll work small, but eventually it will lead into something that is bigger than what it is. Um, then my main goal is actually to have systems and wells to filtrate the water systems throughout the nation. So with that being said, what I see that my nonprofit organization can cause globally is um, impact other small islands because Haiti is not the only place that is experiencing this. Um, Haiti doesn't have a central waste system. There's other places in the Caribbean that does not have a central waste system. And as crazy as it seems, although China is a big place where we get all of our resources, all of our um, stuff and shipment, China has a big waste problem as well. India as well. So um, with that being said, I feel like if I can, if me, Ashley, just one person can make a difference, it would help others to give the push and the idea to make a difference in their areas, in their countries, you know? So slowly but surely, if I am, hopefully, when I do become successful with my nonprofit, it will not only tackle Haiti, but it will go into other nations as well as a, you know, a nonprofit waste organization. But that is my goal for Neto IAPIT. Thank you, Ashley. I think I covered all the contestants. Jadine, did I miss anybody? I think you did. All righty. So let's have this dialogue. I'm going to unmute everyone. I need to see faces. Hello. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's have a dialogue. So there's a lot of discussion about the ideas of these nonprofits. But let's talk about, you know, we talked about businesses, we talked about media. Let's talk about how we can change the impression of the Haitian culture, the people on a global scale. We know number 45 call us the SAIT country. You know, throughout our history, we are known as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in uh, DR, they call us the black devils. You know, there's other, countries, other discussions, identifying who we are. Before we came on the Facebook Live, we had a discussion about what is our true identity. So let's have that conversation. Well, I, I would start and say that as much as we know about Haiti and its history, Haiti is a diamond in the rough. When you find a diamond, most people don't know. It's like coal like black, right? There's there's enough pressure that needs to be that needs to happen in Haiti for it to burst out to be that diamond. I know that Haiti has the potential to do so because of what they were able to do when they were able to get out the three superpowers. So again, as we're talking about this conversation, preserving the culture, 
as these generations are going, oh, um, you know, they're going out, it has to be the new generation with new ideas, new concepts, and what our parents could not do, they did for us because they allowed and opened that door for us to come to a place where we could get the education, that we could have the resources. And now it's our job to take what we've learned and bring it back to the country. And I know last time we had the conversation, Captain Haiti said, you know, what he's doing there doesn't require his presence to be there. But there's other things that needs to happen in Haiti where presence needs to be there, where we're teaching the people. You know, I think one of the things that really has hindered Haiti is that a lot of people have invested. You know, not only Haitian people of Haitian descent, you have people around the world, different cultures, they invest in the country, but there's a level of teaching the people. If I teach you how to fish, then you don't need me like in the next 10 years because I've already planted this seed and you're gonna teach the people that are there. So I believe Haiti is, the, is a diamond in the rough. And when it sparkles, everybody gonna want a little piece of Haiti. And I know we already be there doing what we need to do in the forefront. So that's the hope that I have with the country, with the people, with the resilience, with our history. It's a diamond in the rough and it's gonna take people of like-minded to understand where this country has come from, where it's going, and how they're gonna be part of that narrative. So I'm excited because uh, Haiti is, is the place to be. And I forgot to say, the theme this year for the pageant is um, Haiti, the pearls of the Antilles. La Pelle de, um, was it, Antilles? You know I'm saying it correctly? Yeah, Don't come for me with my Kringlish, okay? But the <laughs> idea is that we are a pearl. We did it one time, we can do it again. So um, it's, it's really collective minded people coming together with their resources, with what they know to be, become that think tank that can actually expand and do the micro economy and do all the different things like she's saying waste management, tackling the things that we see in developing, developed countries that we can bring back um, to the country and, and teach them to do. All right, who wants to chime in on that? Y'all kind of quiet, I hear cricket. Cricket? Cricket? <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the challenge is you know, Haiti's revolution is a similar revolution to the African-American community here in the United States. You know, when we look at the 1950s, you know, when we look at slavery, we look at racism here in the United States, there's still that question of where has our community gone since the civil rights movement? And I think that's the same challenge we have when we look at the Haitian revolution. And, you know, we talked about this the last time, uh, in talking about, we don't want to continue having an 1804 storyline. Yes, we need to remind people about Haiti being the first Black Republic in the New World to win its independence from the greatest army. We hash that into the ground. What is the next storyline that we have? Who is that? What is that next shift? What is that next paradigm shift? What is that next movement that needs to take place? Because if you really look at what happened in 1804 and really before then, because they got their independence in 1803, between 1802, 1803, but it wasn't really declared until 1804 and recognized by other countries, is that they were in a tight, the, the, the heat was so hot, they had no choice. The civil rights movement, the heat was so hot, they have no choice. I think that same heat is happening in Haiti and the United States. We just saw today that a black man in Minneapolis was killed by an officer because the officer kneel, you know, had his knee choking him, suffocating him. So there's still that challenge of people of color where no matter where we come from, we still have a fight that has to be done. Will that fight ever end? We, only time can tell and only God knows. But for our generation, what does our civil rights movement look like? What does our American revolution look like? What does our Haitian revolution look like? So that when people look back at the challenges that we're facing, because the heat is hot enough to have a revolution. Who's going to lead that revolution? What are the, the, the main objectives of that revolution? Are the questions. And is it that we wait for one person? You know, people are saying, who's the next Dr. Martin Luther King? Well, do we need only one natural leader? You know, people are saying for the Haitian community, Kesha and Jesus is no longer here. Do we need only one person? You know, that one person took the challenge. That one person 
knew that there was more to light, just like Dr. King said, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He said that, I see the promised land. And he knew his struggle was not for his generation. He was that Moses that was not gonna go to the promised land, but there was the Joshua generation. And many people refer to our generation, you know, within the millennial, or the later millennials, that we are that Joshua generation, but what is our responsibility? What is our responsibility? What are we supposed to do? What does that look like? How do we organize? How do we push a different, we want, we need to rebrand Haiti. We need to retell our story. How do we do that? Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I want to piggyback uh, what Dr. Fayola said. To me, one of our biggest issue, and I would, I would not, stop proclaiming it, I will not stop mentioning it, is education. A lot of us, um, I don't want to say Haitians, but people like as descendants of Africa, as descendants of people that went through slavery, that were enslaved, a lot of us still carry a slavery mindset. And it can be a very sensitive topic, but this is something that we need to address. Because one thing is, yes, we gain our freedom, but in our mind, the mindset, we still carry a mindset that we are being oppressed. And the oppressor sees that, and they use it against us. Because in their head, they still have this oppressing mindset as we are oppressed in our mind because one of the biggest things is education getting the education that you need and i'm gonna keep on bringing back my job because starting to work in immigration i am finding out so much that i did not know and it is amazing because the knowledge is out there but a lot of time we don't look for it we don't look for it because we don't even know it exists Sometimes we don't look for it because we just, yeah, we just, we're just so happy that we're just the first black freedom in helping other countries, countries reach theirs. But like you said, Dr. Fayola, and this is one thing I always say when people are like, oh my God, why don't you um claim to be Haitian from the rooftop? It's May 18, why aren't you doing this and that? And I'm like, yes, we did that. And I put respect on it because our ancestors died for it. But what are we doing now? Because was I to be Kathy and Flo, I'm going to take her because she's that one woman. Was I to be Kathy and Flo sitting there, I would be looking at us like, what are you guys doing? What are you doing other than saying, oh, 1803, 1804, we were the first black republic. Yes. Perfect. What now? You went from 1803, 1804. If we take the beginning of the years 2000, like, or maybe before that, as a matter of fact, one Haitian um, dollar was worth one American dollar, right? At some point in history. Now we are talking about one American dollar is worth over some good, over 20 Haitian dollars. What are we doing? Because I want, this is my biggest challenge for the younger generation. Yes, we are free, but what are you doing with this freedom? How are you using this freedom to expand, like we said? You are a piece of diamond. And what the ancestors did is they took that diamond off the floor. But who's molding it? Who is shaping it? Who is applying that pressure so it can turn into that beautiful piece? Like Jadine says, that everybody will want a piece of. But right now, yes, everybody wants a piece of it. But it's because they are seeing what we as Haitian are not seeing. It's because they see what they can become and they are not trying to make it become that. They are preventing it from becoming, knowing how we're making it against. We took the time to think about it. Wise enough, we will be able to use these same rules in our favor. So this is my challenge for us. Let's move the conversation because we have 15 minutes. So I just want to make sure we can really dissect this. But I'm gonna put something out there and I want somebody else to pick it up. Are we really free? Hmm. Ha -ha. That's the real question. Oh, Are we yes. really free? 
we got our free license. <laughs> nope. But are we really free? Because if we were free, I would not have to be afraid as one day to be a mother of a black boy that they are walking down the street. Somebody thinks that they're a hoodlum because they're jogging, because in the middle of the night they went to 7-Eleven to go get some Skittles on a soda, or they were in their community selling from their, their trunk, uh, you know, CDs or whatever, whatever. And somebody with, uh, quote unquote, the license to kill is what they're calling Popo now, the police. Mm -hmm. So somebody pick that up for me. All right. What I'm about to say is and not- And I'm not sure what that noise is in the background. Right now, is it Kathy or Melissa? No, Let me mute myself. Okay. What I'm about to say is it's really not popular. Okay. Uh, the cops, when they kill black people in America, right, they kill them one by one. When they kill us in Haiti, they kill us by thousands. Okay. So it's not that I'm not aware of the one that they kill once in a while, okay? It's just, I'm, 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 I'm too impacted by the thousand because they have cops to kill us here and they have you, you, the UN to kill us in Haiti, right? So the thing is, when this North America experience, we have to experience it as Haitians. We're not black. To, to answer, uh, what's his name, Biden's question, right? If you ain't voting for me, you ain't black. So we Damn. as Haitians, when we vote, do we vote as black or do we vote as Haitians? So what I mean by do we vote by Haitians is do we vote for Republican, Independent, or Democrats based on the color of, no, <laughs> the, the representation of our skin? Or do we vote according to our our national interest? Because when we talk about having nonprofit organization, and I have to tell you, uh, Jadine, I'm so impressed by the ladies you have in your organization, okay? And the dream, the project that they have, the way, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of coaching that you have invested in them, and it shows, okay? Praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank and you. here's the reality. I'm pretty sure that you're aware that most nonprofit organizations that are invested in Haiti, in Haiti, these white organizations, they are devil incarnated. Yes, they are. Yeah. Because we know. They're, they're doing organ harvesting on our people. They're doing sex trafficking on our people. They, yep. They're the one polluting in our, our environment. And we're talking about diamond and the rough. They know that Haiti has so many natural resources. Yes. And that's why they create nonprofit organizations to go there and get them. And it's not only Haiti, in, um, in Africa as well. Make some research on Bill Gates and his relationship with Pepsi and McDonald's and uh, all these other companies. Like, okay, I don't want to go to That's why I say it in the Okay, okay. But okay, I, and we were talking about education, right? I got a song for you guys, okay? And and here's the song. Yo fe nou kwe ke se piti t'esclave nou ye. Sa fe nou e ke chen yo merite pase. Fe pi Israel pa ta pou jamen aksepte. Pou li drive yon valot nasyonalite. Se pa jodi a vole a iti. Se pa jodi a viole a iti. Se pa jodi a piye a iti. Se pa jodi a viole a iti. We sell our combat pieds, nous cap crasé nous. We sell our combat, nous cap pété nous. Iridium pata pour faire nous pipo. Passer tête malheureux, cap vive non bon. C'est pas jodi à voler Haïti. So, you could have the maximum information. The reason why I wrote that song is because I can forward you the name of the mining company that are right now exploring Haiti soil. When you go six feet under Haiti soil, even if you own the land, whatever is in the, uh, under the, that six feet, you cannot own it. It's illegal for you to have, uh, I see have marble, we have gold, we have so many minerals, you know, boxes that we could use, but you don't own it. The only way for them to own it is to change legally, is to change the constitution. 
That's why you don't have a government in Haiti right now. So to come back to us today, I don't give a damn about what people think about Haitians. Because for us to get our liberation, there's stuff that we're gonna have to do that is really unpopular. What are we gonna vote for here in the in, in United States? Are Haitians gonna vote as black people or are we gonna vote as Haitians? Are we gonna get vote red? Are we gonna vote blue? Or are we gonna vote red and blue? When we spend our money, how do we spend our money? Do we spend our money as black people? No, they just killed another one of our cousins today, right? They killed our cousin. All right. But we got the guy said, Blue in no shame. But after that, I'm like, okay, why we kiss that black in no show? You gotta focus on what you're doing because it's a fight, it's a war. And Haiti is part of this global war against humanity. And when we talk about humanity, who's the humanity? Humanity is us. Melissa said earlier, she considered herself as a human being first. That's who we are. We are the reflection of our God. So as Haitians, we have that part of our heritage. But as humans, what is it that we do with that history in order to inspire others to defend their rights so we can all be human and get rid of those that are attacking the, the, our race? Sorry. Jesus. So we got to know what we have, huh? Yes. Yeah. That's like if a soldier has a, has a gun and don't know how to use that weapon. <laughs> He's a danger to himself and everyone else, right? Yes. Yeah. We are a danger to ourselves and our own people because we don't realize our own limitations as well as our own capacity. I need someone else to chime in. We got about nine minutes. I want us to give another good five minutes to really go deeper. We had conversations before we went Facebook Live. That's what I'm looking for. Let's go deeper into these conversations. We talked about identity. What is the true Haitian people's identity? Let's break that down. I know I'm going to get it from a historical perspective. I think JD. Wait, 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 wait. But Let y'all not going to be ready for it, though. Wait, 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 wait. Be before you. It. I can tell you your identity. Wait, 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 because you weren't here earlier. So hold on, let me preface the conversation. I see Melissa getting tight in her seat. I can tell you who we are. I'm getting, let me preface the conversation. So the conversation before you came on, we talked from a historical perspective. We tapped in a little bit from a religious perspective and then we tapped in from a cultural perspective. So we tapped in the different names that we are called from those different perspectives. But let's di divulge that. Let's go so deeper tell me into what, that conversation. What, 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 so religiously, what, what do we call? You, go ahead and tell us. You tell us. Who am I judging? Drop okay. knowledge. All right. So the true identity of Haitians, biblically, not religiously, but biblically, we are the lost tribe of Judah. We are Levi. We are the, the tribe of Judah. If no one knows what that is, go to the Bible. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. Haiti and Haitians are Levi. Jamaicans are the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Puerto Ricans is the tribe of Ishtar. And Dominicans is the tribe of Simeon. If someone thinks I'm lying, I need you to go read Deuteronomy 28 and read the blessings and the cursings of the Bible. You're gonna take African-Americans that we're calling African-Americans. African-American is not a race. African-American is not a, 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 a nation. It's what the white man decided to call us when they stole our identity during the Atlantic slave trade. We are the Hebrew Israelites. If no one is getting understanding this, you can go do your research. Haitians are the tribe of um, Judah, which when you look in the Bible, Israel was separated from Judah. We are the Levites. And you can take that to the bank. But that's a whole nother conversation where we can, uh, you know, take it offline. But we are the Hebrew Israelites. I am not an African American. I am not black. I am not Afro Caribbean. I am Hebrew. So, no part three, right? Until we know that, <laughs> until we take the time to know that. We will continue to do what we're doing. When we're fighting the Dominicans, when we're fighting the Puerto Ricans, when we're fighting um, the Jamaicans, we are all cousins. Just like he said, Captain Haiti, 
Taylor already said it. We're all cousins. The guy that died today, that's our brother. That's our cousin. But we don't know this because we have never taken the time to really read the word of God and ask the right questions. Who are the owners of these slave ships? How were they able to go into West Africa and steal us? Why did our African brothers in Africa sold us? These are the questions that no one wants to ask. And until we go that deep, we will continue to do what we're doing today. So you don't know who you are, you will fall for anything. And what you're saying is, I'm not voting for Republican, I'm not voting for, um, what's this other one? This other group. Democrats. Democrats. Because in the end, that's not who we are. We are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. And until we understand that, we will continue to do this, um, we'll play this little game. So did you, you say our black brothers? Yeah, when you when you get your citizenship, it says Haitian American. It doesn't say American Haitian. When you get it Jamaican, it's Jamaican American. So that is, is our blood, not America. You were just born here, but your blood is in Haiti. Your generations and your strong your your um your uh your your genealogy is and ultimately, it's, we're, we're a tribe of Judah. But that's enough for tonight. Um, <laughs> Hold up. So, no, no, no. Wait, 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 Captain Haiti. Uh, did you just say, did you just drop the knowledge that our African brothers and sisters sold us? Yes, they did. They actually sold us because slavery was OK. Slavery was OK. People wanted to be slaves. But the Ashkenazi Jew, these are the people right now claiming to be the chosen God, um, chosen people of God. They went in there and sold us because they found the new world and they weren't capable of building the new world. So if we go to Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curse, and he said, I will send you back to Egypt in ships. They will buy you, they will sell you and no one will redeem you, right? It says we will build nations and you will not be able to enjoy it. You will have kids and they'll be raped. And so the idea is until Judah wakes up and comes together, we will never be able to do what we did. But the beautiful thing is, we are the only Hebrews that were able to overthrow three European countries. That means that's Edom. So we are from Esau, um, not Esau. Esau is Edom. We are Sh um, Shemites. And um, listen, I can I can teach y'all all day, every day. I am a Hebrew Israelite, Jesus, and I'm a Levite. Okay. So who are who are the three? Who are the three? Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Because we got to break knowledge. Because we need to educate people. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I put a good 30 minutes extra on this one today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, learned, I got smart on you. So, okay. so we apologize if we go over time. I know we got three minutes. We said from seven to nine. For those that are watching. I'm getting hot. I'm getting hot. I'm getting hot. So uh, I still got to eat too. So don't play. So if you see my screen go, go left for me. I have to go order my room service before they stop at 10 o'clock. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, we need to take this time to educate each other and educate people of the reality of history. Because I would tell you, at 37, two, a week or two ago, I learned the truth of the Haitian Revolution. And that's sad. Being the child, well, not the child, but being the niece of a human rights activist, being the niece and the, the, the generation, the descendant of people who were religious teachers, religious leaders, and, and community leaders, that I learned my history, my true history at 37. So for 37 years before that, I'm not gonna say I was living a lie, but I was living a half truth. Yes, you are. So break down the knowledge of what those three European forces were. And then we're gonna let Captain Hades pick up. So I want to ask one of the ladies, because we covered this in one of our workshops, what are the three European superpowers that Haiti, the Levites, were able to take out? I found one line. No, Timo, I found one. Oh. Because they were not in your head when they were, they were not in their head when you was dropping knowledge. So somebody so, was taking it. So, so Sarah, you're going to answer? Um, Manika? Ashley? <laughs> but listen, slow down, sis, slow down. <laughs> I'm calling them out. I'm calling them out. Uh, what's the question again? What's the question? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, what are the three, you know, refreshing that, that Haiti was able to was able to conquer? France, the first one. Yeah. All right, France. France. Spain and, um, what is it? What, Portugal? No? Girl, you said Spain. You, let, some, let somebody else get the third one. Oh, you okay. said Spain. You get that oh, one right. right. 
Okay. Alyssa wanted well, the teacher had the day for it. Whip it in. <laughs> Who else? Who wants to drop number three? So we. I know. Let me see. So wait, I think it's only Juna. Captain Haiti, do you know? Um, there's so many <laughs> versions of our site. Uh, I know we resisted uh, German, okay? Uh, so I know French, of course, Spain for the west Spanish. side, uh, the east side of the country, Spain. Uh, and we also defeated uh, Britain. There you go. Absolutely. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding. All right, Captain Haiti, chime in. Okay, uh, one thing that you mentioned by the killing of our cousins, right? And you say when you reclaim our heritage, one thing that is very, very important, okay? Never, 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 ever, ever claim that you're Black American. Yeah. Ever. Even the Haitian American, okay? Claim yourself as Haitian, I'll tell you why. If something happened to me today, I'm born in Montreal, Canada, okay? Something happened to me today on my passport. It's an international incident between United States and Canada. But if I claim my ancient heritage, it's an international incident for my home country. That's why whenever I identify myself, I always name my full father's name, Giosel Jean-Baptiste, and my full mom will not shave it. Because when you do that, you're claiming your lineage and they were born in Haiti. And it, it goes even way deeper than that, okay? Right. So that's the first thing. Second thing, when it comes to us, your identity, your main identity is that you're the children of God. That's the main one, okay? But don't get confused. Whenever you are, okay, you use the one that serves you better in the circumstance so you can take advantage of the reality. Yes. Okay? So one of I go, some people will say, hey, we're Tainos. Yeah. Most people don't know that a lot of us in the Caribbean and Haiti came from North America as well. Black Americans don't know that a lot of them, most of them are original people of the land itself. People don't know that this is not a country, this is America is a corporation. Oh, you hello. Know? Say that again for the people in the back. America is a corporation. Okay. You are under the kingdom of Morocco. When you see this, okay, on the flag, okay, the coat of arms, you see this, the bonnet? This represents the war. There's many interpretations to it. Right now, they, they, they even reverse the color. But the red is, is on top and the blue is in the bottom, right? So the thing is, whoever you are, people see me out. What are you today, Captain Haiti or Martin? What do you want? Okay, let me see what you <laughs> but, but when I say I don't give a damn of how people perceive me, it's because I know what I'm aiming for. You have Hollywood, you have the media, you have hip hop, okay? None of these industries are owned by black Americans, but they dominate as talent. So whatever the message they want to communicate, for example, you see the election circle is coming out. All the media, they're just going to talk about the black men that they are killing because they want the, the black folk to vote for Democrats. Because they're like, yo, but the, the number one issue that they want to have on the table is not reparation for the descendant of slaves. But they want to use, they want to be scared. Oh, you know what? I'm voting for a Democrat because Republicans are racist. They want to make each election for black people as an issue about your the color of your skin. That's why I say you as Haitians, who cares if you vote for Democrats? Did we lose you, Captain Haiti? Oh, I thought it was my phone. <laughs> no. Everybody paused for a second, though. <laughs> you know, and we have to look back because way back when, when this political party started, the Republican <laughs> was <laughs> more <laughs> emotional. We can make up one of us. We die every day. We're talking. Every day we die. 
So now, more of us needs to die in order for us to be able to, to have the luxury of living our feelings. And that's what, I, that's what I need to say right now. And you know, like I was saying before, um, when, we, when we lost you, is that, you know, when you look at the political party and the history of it, during, uh, way back when, when this whole process started about the division, it was the black community that was Republican. Yes. Oh. And they shifted. They shifted because of, uh, and if I and quote me if I'm if, if I'm wrong, correct me. They shifted because of slavery. Yes. Yeah. So that's where there was a Civil shift War. from. Excuse me. The Civil War. Yes. So there was a shift from being Republican, where well, that's what African Americans were, to now African Americans being Democrat. But there's a whole underlying of that anyway, you know, because people had said maybe the people of color need to have their own party, which they tried to. That's when you talk about Malcolm X. You know, you talk about, you know, people along the Black Panther and other movements similar to the Black Panther, and they saw them as a threat because they knew that it would divide the political parties. It would take power away from them. So that that's a whole nother conversation. Just wanted to make sure we had that clarification so people could understand the history. But somebody wanted to chime in, go right ahead. Um, one thing I want to say based on the whole discussion, and I want to add one thing. For me, there is a totally different reality when you're living in Haiti, right? This whole idea of racism, I never experienced that. But I will say that I experienced colorism. So there is a fight between us, between ourselves, where some of us, we don't even appreciate our own because, hey, your shape is darker than mine. And there are others that are like, I don't even appreciate my own shade because my shade is too dark. And there is one thing about me growing up and I am so grateful that I got to love myself in it's in like the whole me. I love Melissa. I love the color of my skin. I love my descendants. I love um, where I come from. And there's just nothing that can change that. And it is very hard for me. It takes a lot for me to look at racism when something happens to me. Now, looking at society lately, looking at the whole country and what we have been experiencing, I see it. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen the documentary When They See Us, where five, not even young men, little boys were arrested for a crime that they didn't commit and they were wrongfully convicted because they are black. So when I look at this, it aggravates me because although I do not want to focus on race, because like I said, I am all about the human race. Do I care that you are white? I, I, I honestly do not. Do I care that you are black? I honestly do not. What I see is a human being. But when you see people in society taking the, the color of their skin as a luxury to do wrong by people. I am a strong, very, very strong advocate for justice and fairness. So to me, color of the skin shouldn't even be a thing. It shouldn't even be a question. Are you white or are you black? It shouldn't. Again, you're a human being. You're a citizen of the world. What just happened? to have a lot more melanin. And that's where, until we can realize that, and this is within us, this is within society as a whole, within the whole world, until we can realize that there's always gonna be this, this shift and this fight. And I hope, I truly hope it can end one day. It might not end with me. It might not end with my generation, but I do hope that one day we will get to that place where we can truly, love, appreciate, respect one another despite the color of our skin and everything else that people used to discriminate against each other. Maybe, sir, if I, I just want to chime in a little bit on what you said, okay? Our main issue is not that we don't realize 
that's why it's equal on, on humans. Our main issue is that we include them in the human race. Let me precise what I mean by that, okay? When you say you, you is color, man, man, right? There's a huge difference. It's more than color. For example, okay, uh, I, I, I did an expose this week uh, about vitamin D. Vitamin D is a very important vitamin for your well-being, right? Mm -hmm. Your reason why you are dark like this is because of the concentration of melanin. The melanin is protecting the biggest organ and of our body, which is our skin. So it's protecting us as humans of, 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 the, of the most dangerous force uh, that we know, which is the UV. So that melanin right there is because we're from the equatorial region of the earth. And if you look at the places in the earth that have the most resources, is where we are the Aboriginal people of. So the thing is not about, oh, I love you because uh, you're white. Hey, we've always been like that. That's why they've been killing us. That's why they've been dominating us. But the, the minute that we're gonna realize, hey, we're gonna put you in time out because what you're doing with our world unacceptable. The minute that we decide to do that, then we re-enter them into the race conversation, the human conversation, with and our condition. Sorry. If I... No, but um, one thing no, I want to say. What? No, one thing I want to say is that this, to me, is not a one-way street. And when I say we need to do it, I am not talking about we as black people, I am talking about we as the human race, meaning for the white people to know what I have been doing to them is wrong. Let me start. And for us to know, and as Christian, as Christians, as humans to say, yes, they did this to me, let me forgive them and move on. I am not saying to forget and for us to bring ourselves, you know, oh, let me love, let me, let, let me be all lovey dovey. But what I'm saying is to give us as a human race a chance to actually share a place that was created for good it was not created for, for let me kill him because he black or i see a white man let me run no it was created for all of us to walk together and i i pray i really do pray that one day it gets to be like that and that we stop the shame blaming i'm blaming you because you're black you were caught because you're black. You were put in jail wrongfully because you're black. Oh, he did that because he's white and he was scared. So there is this. It's not a one-way street. The white is scared of the um. The white is supposedly scared of the black, and the black is scared of the white. But now the black has a better reason to be scared of the white because of our past. Now it doesn't change the fact that. That is our past. What are we gonna do for our future to change this for the next generation? So when my son is walking the street, I don't have to be scared. I am that one person when I see, I can see a white officer and I will look at him, I will tell him, good morning officer, have a great day. Because why are you scared of me? When I just want to be a human being. Just you know, like one you. second, wait, wait, wait. Captain Haiti, I'm gonna come to you, I'm gonna come to you one second. You know, I think, um, I want to chime in because when you were talking, it made me remember when I was in seminary, I don't know what experience God was doing with me. He called me to racial reconciliation in that season. And I went to a predominantly Caucasian, Southern Baptist, evangelical in the Carolinas. And if you understand, you can read between the lines what kind of environment I was in as a black a uh, very vocal, very leadership, very passionate, opinionated young woman. And I remember there was a movie that I watched and I was watching all these different movies of the civil rights movement. I was like, God, what are you showing me? What are you teaching me? What experience are you helping me to go through? And I remember there was one Martin Luther King day that I had to do volunteer service from my church at that time or some organization. And I'm sitting around a group of older black people because it was an African-American community that I, that I engaged in because there's not much Haitians. And at that time I separated myself from my Haitian identity for a number of reasons. 
and I'm sitting there and I had a deep conversation with the Haitian, oh, excuse me, with the African, older African Americans who were sitting next to me. And I said, you know, tell me how you feel. Because a good 50, 60, well, actually more than that. So in the 1950s, you were being chased because of the color of your skin. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, the young boy, Till. Emmett Till. Emmett Till was beaten because of a lie. And not only did they beat him, they exposed, his mother exposed him to show what kind of hatred was existing at that time. And I asked the older African American, I said, how do you, how do you process that? That you have to look now at people who are different colors that give you the experience that you had, that you have to forgive them. You have to not take it personal when you are around them to give you the flashback, oh, back in the days, you know, they, they, they would lynch me or back in the days I had these experiences and challenges. So there's a psyche there that, that I even dealt with. And I'm, and you know, at times I gotta catch myself and I'm gonna keep it real. Because anytime I hear, like for instance, this whole thing about this young man in Brunswick, Georgia. And I know Brunswick, Georgia, because when I lived in Georgia for an internship, we had to go through the whole state because I was working with the state health department and we did, we had a grant for CDC as, on diabetes education. And I was really, I was feeling some kind of way, you know, cause I'm like, you know, this bl young black man, whatever he was doing, you know, and I'm scared to see how this case is gonna go because they're pinning him as someone who went into this develop, you know, this new construction. He was looking around, whatever, whatever, and he visited there frequently. So it's this whole storyline. We're gonna just have to wait and see and just keep praying that justice will be served. But it just makes me feel like, how can I truly be safe? Because every time I try to feel safe and I start to feel safe, another situation occurs that puts me back in being oppressed. And so when Melissa, when you talked about oppression, it is not just here, it's a reality. Because at the end of the day, a black man, regardless if my friend, I was talking to my friend, I was telling her happy birthday, she was talking about a doctor that had a situation. He was telling the officer, this is my house. I'm a doctor, let me go and get my ID to show you proof. The officer did not allow him to go. And we could even talk about Eric Grease, uh, senior from Black Enterprise or one of those uh, major black and uh, um, media pu publications. He was in front of his house. He was a Harvard professor. They arrested him as he was trying to break. They were saying he was breaking into the house. He was trying to break into his own house because he locked the door. And the reality is like, it's a scarlet letter to be black in America. It's not safe to be, even as women. Sandra, what's her last name? Sandra Bland. You know, so it's all these different challenges in the story. It's like every time you want to feel safe, you want to forgive, you want to move past this racial tension, this 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 crisis of, of, of hatred, of colorism, racism, all the isms, all the ills of society, you get pushed back by every experience. I don't know about you guys, but for me, I get pushed back because it's like, damn, like for real, like can we breathe? Can we find a day we can live? It's just like being a Christian. Can you can you one day live and breathe and not be attacked by the enemy? You know, I just had to share that. But One of the things I wanted to add to this conversation as believers, we have to understand that Yahweh knows all. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good, purpose and the wills of the ones that love him. And when we start to understand that Yahweh is a spirit, he doesn't care about color, um, we have to start looking at people from, and this is me speaking, we have to look at people as this is a fallen world that we live in because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And until he comes back to avenge what he says he's going to do in the word of God, all we can do is ask him for his grace and mercy for us to love how he loved. Because when you look in the word of God, it wasn't it wasn't the the unbelievers that was used to put Jesus Christ on the cross. It was the religious leaders, right? And so it's a heart issue. It's not a color issue, it's a heart issue. And the and the way that I've been able to pass through all these things, especially when the black um black uh wasn't it black lives matter? 
which most people don't know is being funded by an Ashkenazi Jew. It's being funded by a white man. Um, the whole idea is that I got to know that in, on a good given day as, as, as a person like me, I have evil in me to do what I don't think I'd be able to do. It's by, it's by God's Holy Spirit that I can say, you know what? When he says, for, how many times you forgive your brother? 70 times 70. That even though that this person has done this, I can pray for this young man. So when I heard about this Ahmad Arbery, the first thing that came to my mind was, did he know Jesus Christ? And where is he right now? Because in the end, um, there's a young man that went to heaven and saw hell as well. And the pastor was giving him a platform to tell his story. He says, you know, when he thinks about Kobe Bryant's death, the worst thing is not to die. The worst thing is to die without Jesus Christ. Because in our in our faith, we know that there's there's two places you're gonna end up. And so I don't wanna walk around with so much hatred that I knock out my my time or, or my my spot in heaven because everyone says this. God is love. Yahweh is love. So if he's living in me, I have to submit myself and ask him to help me so that I can love this person um, the way he would love them. Because in the end of the day, um, they're still human beings. We are, are, we're not perfect. We have stuff that we need to work out. And my prayer right now is for the people that dragged him, that they come to know Jesus Christ and his grace. Because once again, Romans 8, 28, people ask you, how can you serve a God that knows that there's evil in the world? God did not create evil. We chose evil when we decided to eat from that fruit in the garden. And because now we have this knowledge, we now try to, we try to conceptualize what is right and what is wrong. But ultimately, as a daughter of the Most High, I know that vengeance is the Lord. What I want to do with him or do with the person that wronged me, the Lord can take it more better than I can. And, and what I remember is Roman 8, I mean, not Roman 8, 28, the story of Joseph. We're talking about an African-American or, you know, I'm going to say he's Hebrew because I, I know who he is. And you're talking about some Caucasians that dragged him. They didn't know him and they, because of the hatred in their heart. But think about Joseph. His own brothers wanted to kill him because they were jealous of him. His own brothers sold him. But they didn't know that when they did that, he was going to be able to save. He would become the second in command in the land of Egypt. And he would be the one to save his brothers who sold him. So what I want people to understand is we're not God. Let God be God and do what he needs to do. We need to work out our salvation, figure out where we stand with him in this season. Because if people don't understand what time is going on, we are never going back to the normal that everyone thinks that we're going back to. We are being reset right now into a new world order. I need people to take notes. I need you to Google this. This new world order agenda is real. And this new world order is about us. It's about Judah. Once Judah comes together and come together and weep before Yahweh, he will return. Until then, we can play these little games. We can do all this stuff. Oh, I want to be this. But at the end of the day, we all going to leave this earth. Where are you going when you leave this earth? This is what I'm talking about in this season. Because if people don't understand what's going on, I need us to wake up with our spiritual eyes. Yahweh is around the corner. Yahweh return is imminent. Where are you going to spend eternity? So all of these things in a nutshell is a distraction. If we don't understand it and see it, we will continue to do this. Because all they're trying to do is, again, media is controlled by whom? Not us. They give you the narrative. There's a lot of other people that has died before these two people that are making the news that no one talks about. And then we're not going to talk about our own brothers who are killing one another. And then we'll tell them, don't snitch on him. Black oh, who killed this person? So we need to we need to evaluate and examine ourselves because oftentimes we don't see the hypocrisy in what we're doing as, as a people. We kill one another, we set one another up, but it's all good. But let the Caucasian do it. Let the other person do it. Oh, all hell break loose. We got to be accountable for our own people. Let's build up our brothers. Let's tell them who they are. Let them know that they are the kings and the kings that he created. Let's focus on those type of things because at the end of the day, we don't control how we exit here. Yahweh does. Yahweh controls how we exit here. What we need to do is be the light and teach them the word of Yah so that they know who they are. And even if, like the three Hebrew boys, even if we know that we're serving the living God that has everything in control 
and he called us by name since the foundations of the earth. He chose us. He made us that separate nation. We are the chosen Israel. And until we wake up to understand that, we will continue to play, we'll just go around in this circle. We'll go around in this circle until we stand up to be who he's called us to be. So that's my piece on that. And that's why I've been very quiet on that topic because I know at the end of the day, no huffing and puffing is gonna change the fact that we are in a land that don't belong to us. We were stolen and brought here to build it up. They will never respect us because they stole us to build us here. And so until we stand up and go back to the nations that we come from and build those nations you come from, you will always deal with this foolishness. This is not your home. Jesus. It will never be. It will never be. So we need to stop playing these games. Like this country was never yours to begin with. You were stolen and you built it. And go read Deuteronomy 28. That is one of the curses of for Israel for disobeying Yah. So until we understand that and bring our economy, because see, this is here's the problem. What God showed me with Pharaoh. When Pharaoh let the people go and he thought about it, Israel was the economy of, of, of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we make an exodus and we say, guess what? We're leaving like Marcus Garvey tried us to get. They don't want us to leave. They know how they're building up on us. Our money doesn't stay in our community. We get our check and our check goes to the Asian, Arab, um, Hispanic. It doesn't stay in our community. So you can see I'm very passionate about this because I'm tired. I need us to wake up and we need to have these conversations. Find out who you are. Until you don't, you, until you did, we're just playing these little games. And I can tell um, Fayola the same way. It took me thirty. It took me thirty-three years to realize who he called me to be because I chose to take the American identity, which was a false identity. Because in the end, the blood of my parents and my forefathers are from Haiti. And of course, now it took me what thirty at the age of thirty-four. I found out we are the lost tribe of Judah and we're Israel. And that that changes the way you walk, you talk. And at the end of the day, I tell people I'm covered by the blood of Yah. No weapon shall prosper that's formed against me because I'm his child. I'm his chosen. And how he wants to use me, see fit. So that's my, my take on that. And I'm going to let y'all be great. Oh, that yes. was a dissertation. Thank you for okay. your position. Hello. <laughs> Defending your dissertation. We have uh, four minutes. I have a question. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm just, I just want to lay the foundation. I guess I should have did till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. We got four minutes. Captain Haiti, whatever you're going to say, say it in a short, concise way, because whoever is left, you got to comment. You better put your one in the air like the Baptist church so I could identify you because I want to wrap this up. I don't want this to end on us without a uh, proper ending. Yes. Okay. Okay, Captain. My question is, I have an appointment with Yahweh, right? Yep. At 2 p.m. At, at noon, there's a guy, a, a wife and kid at home. At noon, there's a guy that comes home who wants to break my wife and he wants to kill my kid. Yeah. I kill him first. I kill him. Uh-huh. Was it hate or love? I'm waiting for Yahweh at 2 o'clock. At noon, right. he, comes, he wants to kill my wife, he wants to kill my kid and rape my wife. I kill him. Uh -huh. Did I kill him out of love or hate? You're killing, you're killing him out as a natural instinct. That's what you're doing. And, and the idea is that we, we know that Yahweh does hate murderers, so you would have to repent, my friend. Repentance. That's what's so beautiful about Yahweh. That's what's so beautiful about Yahweh. It is not his will for any man to perish, but he has given us some precepts and commandments to follow. So if, if you're defending your wife or your child, he is a merciful God. He understands yeah. that. Um, it's about your motive in your heart. That's what I love about y'all. Uh, hey. I, I mean, I kill did I kill him out of love or out of hate? You're killing him because you're protecting your family, and and that's that's a subjective. That's subjective. Um, I can't think be objective. I can't be objective. I, for you. That's subjective. I think. I think when it comes to that as well, it has to do with, like you said, it's the natural instinct. When you are in the moment of natural instinct, it's a fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. I hate this message. No, you have time to think, let me save my family. So you, to me, 
you can easily say it's out of love because it's a fight or flight response. It's not because, oh my God, I love my family so much or, oh my God, I hate him so much. It's, oh my God, we need to survive. And this is, this, this is the natural instinct in us. And this the same thing matters too, even in immigration. It's the intent that matters. And once you know that wasn't your intention to kill anybody, then you can repent and God knows your heart. And that's what really matters. All right, we have one minute. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. I thank y'all. I want to thank all my guests, Captain Haiti, uh, Nandy, uh, Martin Nandy. We have Melissa Lucien, who is Miss uh, Haiti, Florida 2020, the first ever laying the legacy, laying it down. So we don't put no pressure on her, but we tell her she better rep real good uh, for the others to follow, her successors. We want to thank Jadine Lucent, direct founder, uh, executive director, you know, the big honcho for Miss Transfer Me IET, uh, pageant system, uh, uh, Transfer Me IET, the nonprofit, and her unique, unique academy which is a nonprofit organization doing training to encourage other people to start their nonprofits. We want to thank all the um, the young ladies that were with us. I don't want to name names because some uh, have to come off doing technical issues. So we want to thank all those that join us. I just want to say thank you to those that are watching. We appreciate it. Hope you were educated. Hope there was a provoking conversation that was had here that you will continue on in your circles. Uh, if the month was a little bit longer, I would say let's do part three. But since the month is ending on uh, Sunday, Sunday. I think that's it for preserving your, your the Haitian culture with Dr. Fela Delica as I am the I was the host. I am your Miss Haiti Excellence 2020, and the goal of this project was to bring education and awareness, uh, the real realities, to have the real conversations, not what they teach history books, not what we've been told by different people and different sources, but actually the reality of it. And I say that because this is how my experience came in understanding that it wasn't just a bunch of slaves that came into Haiti to win their independence. They were warriors. They were strategists. They used nature. They used everything that they had. Bookman experience was from Jamaica. You know, the lady that trained him as well to understand about war, the art of war, you know, realizing that we as a Caribbean uh, diaspora need to come in together because we are cousins, we are brothers in the fight. You know, Haiti was the first uh, country in the new world, the Black Republic to help not only the Caribbean, but Latin America, Central America, South America, and help the United States. And so realizing that if we can overpower these big European powers back then, if we can uh, be able to pay off our debt to get our independence back then, then that means Haiti has something to offer. We need to get ourselves together. We need to check ourselves until we continue to wreck ourselves to find out the reality of things, find out our identity, put our heads together, stop being uh, divided because that is the spirit of division that is amongst us. That is an evil spirit. That is the spirit of... I ain't going to say anything else, read between the lines. But, you know, we have to understand that we have to come together. So I hope that this, these part one and part two was the start of that. I, I challenge you all in your respective areas, your localities. You know, I've been sharing on Facebook. So any Haitian group that I was connected to, I shared it. There was Pennsylvania, there was Boston, there was Tampa, there was Atlanta. So we're just hoping that this message gets out and understanding. Go find history books that would tell the truth of who you are. Because the only reason you will know to be set free is because they've been brainwashed. We've been brainwashed with half truth. And anything that's a half truth, that's it's not the whole truth, is a lie. Oh, oh, oh bam. It's a lie. It's a lie. So, you know, it's not about hatred. It's not about division. It's not about separation. It's about identity and truth. As the word of God says, seek truth and it shall set you free. Trust me, I was set free last two weeks when I found out the real deal, Holy Field, about the reality of my history as a Haitian American. Huh? I'm not to tell you. What you mean? The real history. Oh, we, I just dropped it. <laughs> so it's the reality of the Haitian uh, Haitian revolution and our impact and our contribution to society. That's what I was looking for earlier, not impact, our contribution to society. And once we world. realize that we are currently- to the world. Contribution uh, to the world. Yes. So once we realize that we are contributing every day and if we collectively come together and celebrate each other, 
we can have a stronger impact. We can change the narrative that has been told about us. Uh, to really be of a country that is a beautiful people, a beautiful nation, beautiful history, uh, a beautiful tradition. As we, we did an icebreaker talking about our favorite foods. And so I just pray peace and blessings to you. I pray that you find out who you are and whose you are. So the rest of your life will not be in a bubble. The rest of your life will not be in lies. The rest of your life will not be in the limitations of how small they're trying to make us feel. But we are actually as big as they are even bigger because we got it in us. The blood runs through us. Our ancestors' blood runs through us, not just from Haiti, but even Africa. And even, you know, as the last Israel. tribe is to... Can I finish my sentence? Israel. <laughs> the last yeah. tribe of Israel. So once again, we thank y'all for joining us. Those that have watched, we appreciate you all. Peace and blessings to you all. The rest of the month, we got a couple of more days left. Let's celebrate. Let's live it up. Let's educate. Let's empower. Let's inspire. Let's put out good stuff. As Melissa was talking about, uh, let's put out good stuff on social media to educate people. Every country has issues. Every culture, every people group has issues. But let's not put out our dirty laundry. Let's really show them who we really are. And we can deal with our dirty laundry in-house, not outside. Y'all take care. Be blessed. Until next time. Thank you again. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Good night. Good night. Captain Haiti was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love Captain Haiti. I know, right? With all that static in his background. <laughs> I know it's him because I turned my thing off a couple of times. Y'all take care. Be blessed. <laughs>